Hi, everyone. Thanks for turning out. I'm Laura Miller, and I am the books and culture columnist for Slate.com. Um, this is another, and this is another social distancing social from Future Tense in partnership with uh, a partnership of Slate, New America Foundation, and Arizona State University. Today, we're talking about the future of books. And I'm joined by Priscilla Payton, uh, who is vice president and executive editor of Simon & Schuster, and Brad Tensley, who is the national political writer for CNN Politics. Hi, Priscilla and Brandon. <laughs> I can't hear you. You have to unmute. <laughs> hey, nice to be here. <laughs> so, thanks for having us. Um, I, I, when I was asked to sort of moderate this, one of the things that it, it brought up, brought to mind or brought up in my memory was how in the early 2000s, it seemed like everywhere you went, there was like a panel discussion of the future of books and people making a lot of predictions about the future of books and how things had to change and which way they needed to go. And, um, and that was all, um, tied to the emergence of ebooks and ebook technology. Um, and most of what people said at that time did not turn out to be true. Um, ebooks did not take over from print books. Um, and, uh, and, and in particular, younger readers, more than any other demographic group, preferred print books. So the idea that book publishing needed to change uh, with this technology. Well, maybe it did in some ways, but, um, but not maybe in the ways that people thought. And um, I'm wondering first, Priscilla, uh, I don't know if you remember that time or you know, the, the kind of um, craziness that, that uh, went along with it, but um, do you feel that, um, I don't know how, much credit you gave to that idea at the time, um, but or, or but uh, what do you think about it now? Do you think any of those predictions are likely to pan out? And how has that changed your own personal feelings about predicting the future of books? Because for me, I just like now I'm totally terrified to make any predictions. I'm still terrified of making predictions. <laughs> I was then, and I am now. Um, uh, before in becoming a book publisher, I was a political reporter, so I learned humility you early. But um, what I would say is that, um, yes, you're absolutely right. I remember the charts. You would see the eBooks sort of, you know, go straight up and, um, and think that's the end of the bookstore. Um, but um, what happened is that uh, about five or six years ago, that trend stalled and, um, as you say, you know, physical books continue to, to, to thrive. Um, the biggest development, though, is that not only do millennials like physical books, they love audiobooks. And um, that has taken off as a genre, and that is also very good for publishing. Because what it means is that you can take a book with you as you vacuum your living room, you could take a book with you uh, everywhere. And um, that is also, frankly, at a time when we needed a, a, a very reliable source of, of income, it has turned out to be, to be exactly that. So um, the good news for me, I mean, to me, the big headline is so simple, which is people will read, are, are reading more than ever. They're just doing it across a whole different set of platforms, but the, the, this, this, and I call it the Harry Potter phenomenon, which is, you know, everybody thought, you know, we were, we, we were no longer making generations of readers. Well, you know, uh, a whole series of, of books of that popularity came along and, and, and what we have is generation after generation of readers who just changed maybe change the way they consume what they have consume a page but they don't change their desire to see something on a page one of the one of the changes that feels the most urgent right now has been about diversifying 
the industry. And yeah. you know, we've just recently seen the Day of Solidarity where 1,100 uh, publishing industry workers, um, you know, took a day to, to do whatever they felt was necessary to support um, people of color who were writers or who worked in the industry and, and have exacted some promises, although it's always <laughs> clear what exactly uh, those promises will pan out to be from management about, about making, uh, making the industry more representative. It's, it's very white. I think it's anywhere from, I, I have some figures right here, depending on which survey you look at, it's anywhere from 76% to 84% white. Uh, where where the general population is 60% white, and um, Hispanics and Blacks in particular are uh, underrepresented, and um, and I'm curious, you Brandon, I, I you're a young writer of color, and I don't doubt that you have ideas for books, or you're probably working on one. <laughs> How does the publishing industry look to you from your perspective? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting for me because I, um, on the one hand, I see that there are certain more diverse voices that are being represented, that are out there, um, and those are, I think these are voices that a lot of people love, and they really elevate and they celebrate, um, but then when you kind of take a step back, you realize that everybody's talking about the same few people, <laughs> so it seems like, you know, maybe like a few people get in, and, you know, we have the ta Coates books, um, which are invaluable and, you know, people are revisiting them right now in light of all the protests. Um, but then you also think about all the people who have not been that successful, who have not been able to actually uh, break through. And when you think about it, you know, it's, I, I think it's, uh, I don't want to say necessarily disheartening um, as if like the, the industry hasn't been changing, um, but you see how much it still needs to change um, to find uh, writers who, not only want to write these stories, but are empowered to uh, actually write the stories. I think um, one thing that I've noticed, you know, recently, especially um, on Twitter, I don't know if you, you probably noticed the different campaigns where people are trying to talk about what they were paid for their books and things like that. Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty galling to see, you know, somebody like Roxanne Gay got paid like 70,000 or something for a bad feminist. <laughs> um, and it's just like, she was already pretty, well known at by that point and you know was really um uh respected as a writer um and so you see stuff like that and you also see people or at least i've seen people talk about um they'll they'll have a, an idea for a book project and maybe they'll approach an editor and the editor might say like this sounds really good um you know this step like this is a story that needs to be told but i don't know if i'm the person <laughs> to work on that story which is, you know, it's sort of a double-edged sword because I think on the one hand, you know, it shows a degree of self-awareness that is important. Um, you know, you don't want to necessarily mess up somebody's work um, if it's not something that you feel comfortable working with. Um, but on the other hand, you still need those editors. <laughs> um, you still need people who are comfortable working with these diverse stories and the uh, sorts of stories that, you know, maybe it makes people uncomfortable to uh, edit a book about race and racism, but at the same time, like that just shows like, okay, we need to make people get to a point where they feel comfortable um, and they, you know, have the resources <laughs> to be able to actually do this work because it, you know, it does impact a lot of the stories that are told um, and people's willingness to tell those stories if they think like, oh, well, somebody seems to like this book, but or this book idea, but uh, they, seem skittish about uh, sort of taking it on themselves. So those are just my sort of general observations, especially over the, the past uh, two to three weeks with the protests. Well, do you feel like they're skittish because they're basically white editors and they don't feel like they understand the issue in the organic way that an editor of color would? I do. Um, you know, and I, I think it's a matter, it seems like, on the one hand, it seems like it's a matter of sort of respect. Like, I don't necessarily want to botch uh, somebody's, uh, you know, very intricate, nuanced story about race. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think that can also be sort of a crutch uh, so that people don't have to <laughs> do the work required to actually rigorously think about these issues that clearly there's an appetite for people uh, to, to consume and to read about. Um, and so I do think it's a matter of that disconnect between uh, sort of 
lived experience um, and the sort of intellectual experience that you're that you're supposed to be able to work with. Um, and it's a question of how do you bridge uh, that divide? How do you get people? How do you get white uh, publicists or white editors to feel comfortable uh, really throwing their weight behind these sorts of stories? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that everybody's talking about this week is the fact that the paperback bestseller list on Amazon is almost entirely books about anti-racism, which is exciting. But then you realize most of the people who need who are buying those books are probably white. <laughs> because I don't think black people necessarily need to read about how to be anti-racist. So, um, so in a weird way, most of those books are written by people of color, but they're, they're presumably written for still like so much publishing for a majority white audience, even though, you know, there are lots of readers of color who are interested in reading about their own, you know, fiction about their own experiences, other kinds of stories about their own experiences. Um, Priscilla, what do you think are some of the most promising or even effective, I mean, the industry has not budged that far on this, but like, have you seen strategies or policies that seem particularly helpful or promising to you in this? I mean, basically to get more editors. More voices. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, you mean strategy? Well, I was going to say, <laughs> to, to uh, take up where Brandon was at, I think that this, the solution to skittishness is, is, is to have a diverse you know, uh, imprint. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right that publishing remains one of the most starkly white um, businesses uh, around. And it's, uh, you know, I guess that it's, it's, it has the capacity to be dangerous because presumably um, books have something to contribute to the culture. So that, by definition, is not a healthy situation. I mean, you're right that the good news is that I just was reading the, the New York Times bestseller list, the top 10 entries, print and ebook nonfiction, are, are about race. I mean, that's never... <laughs> It's not happened in our <laughs> lifetimes, ever. It starts with white fragility, uh, number one. Number two, so you want to talk about race. Number three, how to be an anti-racist. And it goes all the way down to our, the, our favorite, Just Mercy. Uh, and, and of course, number 11 is, is Michelle. Um, I think, uh, I, mean, I mean, based on what I've seen, I don't, we, the strategy is, is, is that the, the people who uh, have the right nerve endings for these stories should be all of us, I think. I mean, it sh we, there shouldn't be a skittishness uh, about it. But more importantly, we just, we just need to change how we hire. Um, it's really basic. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, there's a, there, I mean, I, I don't want to get into detail, but there's still a, a, a sort of, you know, uh, a, a, a kind of it's on the side kind of attitude as opposed to it's integral to our list. It's not this thing we do over here, you know, and that, that, that's a big attitude that needs to change. I mean, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm, if I get any of this wrong, Priscilla, because I haven't actually technically worked in book publishing, but my understanding is that for like decades, the economy of book publishing ran on the cheap labor of sort of junior staff who all came from like a, the same set of East Coast schools who were mostly women who maybe at, at a certain point, I, I mean, many of them were not even necessarily on a real career track. That was they, This was just their little hobby job because their parents were rich, that they were doing until they married a stockbroker or whatever. And that that was like the economic model of publishing, that your, that your junior staff were people who did not need to be paid a living wage or to really have, a, a, you know, that you didn't need to offer them like the possibility of ever getting one. And, um, and, it seems like it's only gotten worse uh, because the industry is in New York and, um, and it's more and more difficult to, for anyone on, you know, even a middle-class income to live there, let alone what um, editorial assistants are, are paid. Um, and yet 
everyone always says publishing is a low margin industry. So I think, you know, one of the issues is, is partly that there's a certain class of people who can afford to work for publishing, who can, you, you know, work their way up in publishing. Um, you, you, I'm assuming that you came in at a higher level from journalism, right. which definitely happens. Mm -hmm. um, but for people who want to start out kind of in the trenches and work their way up, they have to be able to live in New York on a pittance for several years at least. And then there aren't that many, there's not that much, you know, there's no guarantee. There's not that much space to move up in. So, um, so that limits the candidate pool a lot. It limits people by race, but it also limits them by, you know, class. class. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering what are some of the measures that can be taken to deal with that? Because I feel like that's just like a, a wall that you hit at a certain point. Well, I, um, you're, you're, you're right that uh, seven, 50 or 70 years ago, there was a culture of uh, where, where publishing was, was, you know, that your entry job was for, you know, people who could afford to not make a lot of money. Um, I would say the salaries of en entering people uh, are still low and are still difficult to live on in New York City. If there's one, if, if there's if one of the things that comes out of the pandemic is that we're suddenly able to sort of expand the universe of where people can live and edit, um, that would be a very good thing. I spoke to a brilliant editor today who, had to, who was let go of his job by another publisher because he wanted to relocate to Providence. And I said, you know what? You're gonna get hired because no one cares anymore where you edit your books. Um, so that's, that's the good thing. Um, I think the biggest remedy is, is to change the, uh, the, 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 the range between the higher salaries and the lowers. You don't make a lot of money even at my level in publishing, meaning at, at, at vice president level. It's not like working on Wall Street or um, at a high level at a corporation, at a big, you know, IBM type place. But um, there is still, I think, quite a gap between what entry level editors get paid. Um, and um, part of, I think, the philosophy behind that is you actually get trained right out of school. You get trained on the job, you know. So um, what that, I, the good news is, is that what I, what I have seen in recent years is a lot of hiring of, of, of non-white very uh, um, uh, am, ambitious for books type people who who just have to be near a book every day of their life, and they're you know they there is more there's the pool is getting larger, and we are getting better at um, finding those people and hiring them. Uh, well, one pr promising concept has come out of the the organization we need diverse books which uh started as a in children's book publishing which is to sort of help fund internships for people of color and i would hope you know other lower level jobs so that people can can actually <laughs> afford to get started in the business um, if they don't come from money. But, um, but Brandon, I want to ask you what you think, uh, you know, what you feel is, is missing. You know, you're a younger reader, you're a reader of color. What do you see the book publishing industry not providing to readers like you? One th and, and this is such a, such a tricky topic. Uh, so I'm being very careful about how I talk about it. But, um, you know, one thing I think about is a need to sort of expand the universe of what kinds of stories people want from writers of color. <laughs> um, I think there's often a sort of um, assumption, and it's not totally inaccurate, that, um, you know, the only topics that writers of color are able to talk about or experts on are their own lived experiences. Um, and so I feel like beyond sort of the genre of, you know, a memoir or 
um, you know, collection of like first person essays or something like that. Um, you don't see as much, or at least I haven't seen as many um, sort of books that allow that range of creativity, that range of exploration, that range of interrogation. Um, and again, you know, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing, but I feel like it becomes a bad thing when that's the only thing that's really available. Um, where it seems like that's the only way to break into the industry is like, okay, I guess I have to, you know, dissect <laughs> some part of my life um, uh, for, you know, make my make a part of my life legible for white readers, white audiences. Uh, and I guess that's the thing that sells, so I'll do it. <laughs> um, so I think being able to um, uh, understand that there are many, many, many things <laughs> that writers of color, that readers of color are interested in besides uh, purely learning about um, sort of their own experiences. Again, not saying it's not important, but you know, it's expanding that conversation, expanding that representation. Or just the, I, I mean, what I've also heard some of the writers say is just the focus on, only on the traumatic experiences, yeah. <laughs> you know, as opposed to like, it's a whole range of, of um, you know, it's, it's human lives. They, mm. they have everything in them. Mm -hmm. um, are you working on a book yourself? I am trying. Um, it's, it's, uh, I guess it's not related to, I'm not, I'm not guilty of what I just said. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the sort of the idea that I'm interested in is uh, sort of Whitney Houston as this cultural figure, mm -hmm. um, somebody who hasn't gotten um, the sort of um, more cultural criticism treatment. Um, and so I'm really interested in sort of uh, looking at how she is somebody. Uh, who in a lot of ways was sort of her, her life and her career were a microcosm of the expectations that we have, that mainstream society has of black artists. Somebody who came in, um, you know, very uh, pop heavy, who is, you know, obviously black, but sort of, you know, didn't want her to seem too black um, and how that sort of changed the trajectory of her career later on. Um, especially, you know, there was the infamous moment where she was booed at the Soul Train Awards in 1989. Um, she changed the sound of her music after that. Um, so I am really interested in sort of this this broader sort of legacy of the the effects of uh, mainstreaming on, uh, in particular, Black artists. Um, so I, I'm guilty a little bit of what I just said. <laughs> um, I, I do like expand it at least to like music. <laughs> well, it sounds fascinating, and maybe there's somebody who's uh, listening in who works in publishing who will find that intriguing and talk seriously. <laughs> it sounds great. Um, Let's um, talk a little bit more about technology because Future Tense is a lot about technology. Um, what you said, Priscilla, about audiobooks really struck a nerve with me because I've been writing about them for a while. I got into them maybe about 10 years ago and they're just a complete addiction for me. I, I don't actually, I can completely control the number of physical books I acquire, <laughs> but the audio, like I'll just, anytime one's on sale, I'll go, oh, I'll probably want to listen to that someday. So now I have like, uh, we love you, Laura. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it does seem like there's a lot of competition for podcasts and um, uh, there's actually a great uh, app called Autumn that now has top level audio book readers reading long form journalism, which was just like a dream come true for me. Um, uh, first of all, Brandon, are, are you an audio person at all? Or are you just an eyeball reader? Um, actually both. Well, more of an eyeball reader, but it was interesting at the, the top of the conversation when you mentioned uh, people, um, you know, millennials, um, I'll be a representative for millennials for a second, <laughs> uh, but millennials, um, you know they like both or at least they're they see the the benefits of both it's funny i'm in two book clubs um uh that i joined sort of joined slash started once the pandemic started and so uh one is a gay book club and we're reading um and this one, i'm reading a hard copy of uh politics the form of a mortal girl by andrea lawler uh, which i think came out a couple years ago and then the other one is um the chiffon trenches uh by andre uh tally um and that one's uh for me, that's a that's an audio book. Um, yeah. So that's the one that I listen to, you know, when I'm like cooking dinner or uh, cleaning up the house or something. So I feel I, when you said that, you know, people are doing both. <laughs> I'm literally doing both of those right now. So yeah, yeah, I have definitely seen from some of the younger readers that I've met this love of the print book as like an escape from screens, you know, which is which is which was not what was anticipated, but that is is 
you know, like you can find, see you know, there are TikTok videos of just people opening books and turning the pages in this we, a strange way that I just um, feels um, kind of alien to me. You know, it's almost like a fetishizing of the fact that it's on paper. Um, but it clearly is, is, is presented as this relaxing escape. And, um, and yet, well, I don't know, print sales really did, did really get a boost during the pandemic. So maybe um, that kind of fits with all of that. But then audiobooks are the, are kind of the book that you read so that you can multitask, <laughs> really. And, um, and I, I mean, I think it's great. But on the other hand, I know there are a lot of people who feel like it's not really reading because you're not giving it your full attention. Um, it'll be interesting to see where that goes, but the, but the more popular audiobooks become, the more significant the performance becomes because it's not just like a simple translation from the page to the microphone. There's another artist involved and that can make a huge, huge difference. And as you were saying, Brandon, uh, he reads his own book, Tiling? So that's got to be fantastic, yeah, right? Really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we're at the kind of at the point where we can take some questions. Is that? I don't know. I can't tell. I thought we were at that point, but I'm not getting any um, any signals from the powers of be. So um, while we're waiting to figure out if people have questions, Priscilla. Um, uh, you mentioned audiobooks, but what else do you see on the horizon in the book business? Well, today um, we acquired a book uh, that's going to come out in four different formats immediately. One is, um, the first is as an audiobook because it's by a, a famous artist. Then, it, then, the, then the physical book is going to show up and then at some point it's going to become both a CD and a vinyl. Uh, and it's it's a book of poetry, uh, and um, I, I'm only mentioning that because we never would have sort of five years ago there would have been first the hardcover, then the paperback, and then then and and the ebook comes out. So now there's a lot of experimentation going on with what does this book need uh, to get its biggest audience? What does its its audience want specifically? Um, uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago, um, uh, people discovered graphic books and it was a way, for instance, of telling the story of the Iranian revolution. Who knew that you could tell that story in a, in a in Persepolis in, in a graphic novel or in a graphic nonfiction book? So, um, that, I think that that is made a big difference. There are a lot of experiments that haven't worked. At one point, when I first joined the business, which is, God knows, 12 years ago, everybody thought, we'll have books, um, we'll have ebooks, and then in the ebooks, you'll be able to press a button and, you know, either make a comment or, or get, get an audio, a, a video that will accompany your ebook. Well, guess what? Sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> Readers just said, no, I just want a book. Just give me a book. Let me read the story, you know. So we've, the, the point is that um, we have experimented. We continue to experiment. Oh, another thing that we tried that did work was, oh, let's do, an event will happen in the world. And let's, let's, let's get David McCullough to write the historic version of the story, and we'll put it out in ebook in five, five in five, two weeks. And you know, people didn't. You couldn't find those books. People weren't interested. Um, that didn't work either. So, the good news is we keep experimenting, and and uh, and you know, and that's good. And we we should continue to do that as we did today when acquiring this uh, book. Okay, we do have a, thank you, Priscilla. And we do have a question now um, from anonymous attendee. Thank you very much. Um, this person asks, as a writer of color, are, are there any good resources for those of us who are interested in one day writing a book, but are finding the barrier of entry into this space a little intimidating? Um, 
I think that um, it really kind of depends on where you are, doesn't it? Because if you're uh, taking classes or you belong to a writer's group, I mean, I think that writing in itself is isolating. And then if you feel like maybe there's not that many people like you in this world that you're trying to break into, that makes it even worse. And so I think that kind of the first step is to build a community when you, you know, meet other writers, you maybe take some classes, you maybe join a writing group, you start to share information and network. Maybe you meet a writer who is published and they recommend you to their editor. Those are the, the I mean, I hate to say this, but that's kind of the way that it, it works, partly because there are just so many manuscripts floating around out there of such, you know, as a general rule, not great quality that everybody needs somebody to help them find the good ones. And it's usually somebody that they know. So, um, so the, the, the thing I would say to do is even though writing is such a solitary activity and you may feel like it's just this alone thing you do and you don't want there to be other steps in the way that building a community with other writers is kind of your first step towards entering into the community of, of published writers and people who work in the book business. But I, I don't, maybe Priscilla, you might have something else. I, I would like to add to that. I think that's really well put. But the other way to do it is go look at your bookshelf or go to a bookstore and go to the acknowledgments and see who the agent was on your, on your book, on the book. If you, if it's a book that you love you and the, and the, and the book will have an agent, a literary agent, and that agent is going to be predisposed to really wanting to hear your voice uh, because you, you've loved a book that he or she has represented and you think that person can really hear you. Um, and there are uh, agents who have a great track record um, with the books that I mentioned earlier um, that are now dominating the bestseller list. Um, and you can find them if you just go there and they will, they, 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 I think they're, um, they will listen. Yeah. Um, I, it's another, here's another question. It used to be said from Andres Martinez, um, it used to be said that big bestsellers would subsidize a lot of worthy books or bets. I think, I think you mean just gam titles that, are worthy, but you don't necessarily know they're going to be successful. I think that's what Andres means. That might not sell too many copies. Um, and is this a, so is this a roughly accurate description of the business model or has that changed? Basically, are there sort of big bestsellers that are more or less guaranteed that sort of give a publishing company the money to try other things, maybe books that won't, necessarily earn out their advance or maybe sell a million copies that they want to publish just because they believe the book should be out there or or book or books by authors who maybe are not quite there yet but who they think might get there someday and i guess priscilla that's one for you really right um um it it's, it's it's true but it's a little less true than it was a few years ago because we did benefit from what is known as the long tail, meaning the idea that you could, uh, the internet brought about a sort of flattening effect, which meant that more things that are smaller could last longer. Um, but I would say that frankly, if, if you gave me a choice between an instant bestseller that stays on the New York Times bestseller list for two weeks or a book that, um, that backlists and that's, that, that your grandchildren are gonna pull out of the library. That's, that's really the model that we all aspire to. And it's hard, and that's the hardest thing we do is figure out, is this book gonna have endurance? Is it gonna have value? Are we gonna look at it in years from now and say, oh, that was the best biography I ever read and pull it out again and recommend it to, at other next generations that's where that's where i think you really make money yeah um another anonymous attendee asks can you speak to publishing houses choosing or not choosing to publish members of the trump administration or other controversial figures like woody allen and priscilla you're the editor of john bolton's book 
weeks. So maybe you can speak to that. So he um, was already a house author. He had published a book years ago called, um, I can't believe I, my brain is gone, but it, it, was, it was a modest uh, selling book. But it, and so we have what is called the option on his next book. So when he approached us, um, he, you know, we, we had the, you know, we were inclined to publish him because we had had a relationship with him. Um, I think the book was called Surrender is Not an Option. That's what it was called. Anyway, um, you know, um, I don't know that I'm typical of the publishing industry. I mean, I come from journalism, you know, and when I was there, you know, we put, you know, Michael Moore on the cover one week and Ann Coulter on the cover the next week. And the idea was to sort of try to get across the range of, um, of voices out there and the, the kind of different important cultural uh, and political influences that were shaping our politics. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I've also published Hillary Clinton's memoir, What Happened, um, because I, you know, but I also published Carl Rove's memoir about his time in the White House. So I, I just feel like as first drafts of history, if they are books of quality, um, and I believe those books were, um, then, you know, they are important contributions to um, what, we're, what we need to know about how our country is either moving forward or not. And um, so I, I tend to think there shouldn't be a sort of, we only publish, uh, on the other hand, you know, if a book is going to say things that are irresponsible and if it's not going to be, you know, um, a quality book, then, then you wouldn't publish it. What do you, what do you think, Brandon? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I like the way that uh, Priscilla just framed it in terms of, um, you know, publishing the first drafts of history. Um, like that sounds like a, a fair and rigorous way to sort of... Um, uh, I don't know, like at least give the opportunity to have these kinds of conversations. And I especially like how, uh, Priscilla, how you phrase it in terms of you want to understand the, the influence, uh, the, the forces that are influencing our cultural and political conversations. So, um, yeah, and like, you know, you, you have a brain. So like if something is, um, if something is bad, if something is inaccurate, if something is, uh, you know, just wrong or inflammatory, then, you know, you wouldn't publish it. But um, otherwise, yeah, it sounds like, um, especially in this moment, it seems like a good uh, place to find yourself in. Um, just personally, it's not my choice to publish things or not, but I've been working on a piece that involves reading a lot of um, books by former members of the Trump administration. And, um, you know, m most of them are not people that I ad admire or respect, but nevertheless, I'm getting a lot out of those books. I mean, I'm reading them, uh, you know, clearly with, uh, you know, a lot of skepticism, but I'm also, uh, I, I do feel like I'm gaining valuable knowledge from them. I think when you talk about someone like um, Milo, whose last name I can never pronounce, who's basically just a sort of cheap provocateur, who, you know, 80% of the things that he says aren't even true, then I think you get into it like that's just trash and you don't necessarily want to publish trash. But I don't think that just because I disagree with someone politically, if they've had some kind of important role or, or they've seen things or even if their version of history, I, I can see something, some kind of truth through it, even if I don't credit it, I, I still like to have that out there. Okay, here's a question from Jennifer Howard. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, someone I never met, but who I used to work with back in the day a bit. Um, she says, hi, everybody. Thanks for doing this. Any thoughts on what's currently happening with the book distribution chain, Amazon and Ingram, and how that's affecting publishers and booksellers? And I don't know if Jennifer means with the, co the pandemic or just sort of before that. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but uh, that is something I am completely incapable of commenting on. How about, how, how about you, Priscilla? Um, 
Well, if it's about the pandemic, um, I mean, you know, um, the bookstores shut down, um, Barnes and Noble shut down, um, and um, uh, so a lot of the consuming of books happened uh, online. But even at the beginning, Amazon uh, made medicine and food a priority for shipping, so books fell down the priority list. Um, and so it was difficult even to get books. One of the good things that happened is the publishing industry got together and started started something called bookshop.org, uh, which I know you know very well, mm -hmm. both of you, which allows you to basically allow get a book and from your local bookstore, even though the bookstore is closed and, and, and make sure that they get the, the money um, for it. Um, not Amazon. <laughs> not, and also that, the, 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 um, that it goes to supporting, you know, uh, the, the people in the industry who get these books out. Um, but, but I'm not gonna, you know, there, there, there was certainly disruption in, in our warehouses uh, and there continues to be. And, um, you know, it's, it's a heartbreak, um, but I think um, for authors, I think mostly because, you know, there's nothing like working on a book, let's say for five years, as Laura says, all by yourself. Your spouse is tired of hearing you talk about it. <laughs> finally, finally, you get it out there. And, you know, there are no bookstores that, you know, to, to, to showcase them. But more importantly, the story on television or on the radio is, um, is, is, is makes it impossible for your book to get any oxygen. Now, very inventively, I think a, all the publishing houses found ways to put their authors out there through virtual events and, and get their voices heard. And there've been um, some, some wonderful op opportunities. We had to learn every week what was working and what wasn't, but, um, you know, I have a book I'm very excited about um, coming out in July, which uh, does touch on race because it's the story of a, a friendship between um, Aminat Tussauds and Anne Friedman, the, 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 the uh, co-hosts of Call Your Girlfriend. Um, and it's really a story about big friendship. And um, they have found their audience already. We know it's there. The, in, independent booksellers are ordering the book and they're getting their message out in an unconventional way, but, but they are getting it out. Yeah. I mean, I think this crisis is just a reminder, like it, it impacts different titles differently for an established author uh, who has a new book out, a Stephen King, whoever. It's kind of in a weird way, the pandemic is kind of great because people had this idea that they would just be home all the time reading. I don't know if people, why people with kids would think that they would have that much reading time, but um, you know, book sales were up for the first few weeks of, of the quarantine, I think because people had that in mind. But one of the main ways that, that people find out about new authors, debut authors, authors who are outside of their comfort zone is through a bookstore, uh, especially if they are lucky enough to have a bookseller who really knows them and their tastes and who says, oh, oh, Brandon, I have just the book for you. Come over here. Let me show you. That's, you know, that's what the local indie bookstore sh should be doing and is doing in a lot of communities. And with that gone, it's much harder for a new author to, to be launched. Um, I um, have a great question from Kevin Sack, which I think I'm going to toss to Brandon because it has to do with writing nonfiction. Um, given the controversy over American Dirt and the general sensitivities of the time, can you discuss whether there were new challenges for or burdens on white nonfiction authors writing about race-related topics? That's something that we talked about from the other from the other side. The editor is like a you know, not a person of color and they're editing. But what, what about um, how, I mean, this is white nonfiction authors. And I think the thing about American Dirt is that it was fiction and, and, and it chose to tell its story from the perspective of uh, a person of color, even though the author was white. And many people felt that there were many writers of color who could also tell that story. Um, so why was this 
white author getting all of the oxygen, as, as Priscilla would put it. But what about writing nonfiction, history, biography? What do you think authors of those kinds of works need to be thinking about, perhaps more than they have in the past? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 I think that's such a good and interesting question because, you know, I, I think the sort of <laughs> facile way to think of it is, you know, like, oh, like, white people can't write about, you know, write a review about a movie that deals with race or, you know, deep dive investigative book um, that looks at, you know, I just read a book um, a couple months ago by uh, Jerry Mitchell that looked at um, sort of unsolved civil rights murder. <laughs> it was Priscilla's book. Yeah, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah that, and I thought it was fantastic. Um, uh, or, you know, like A.O. Scott, I still remember he, his review of Moonlight a few years ago and how uh, beautiful that, that review was. Um, you know, Moonlight is a movie that is uh, not about A.O. Scott's like own lived experiences. It's about, you know, Black queerness. Um, and so I think what sets these sorts of writers apart is that it's, um, they do the work of just understanding the different issues and the experiences. Um, it's not something that, it's not like they just sort of hop into a stereotype um, and write in that way, but it's about talking to people, it's about listening to people, it's about doing the reading. Um, I still think about this um, Nicole Hannah Jones quote from an event last year, or maybe the year before, uh, where she said, um, you know, you wouldn't be a scientist, um, you wouldn't be a scientist without studying science, and yet we have people writing about race in this country who don't know a thing about race in this country. Um, and so it's that sort of being rigorous about what you're writing about and doing the actual research and the homework and the reading. Um, and I think those are the things that sort of give you the ability to write about these things, um, write about experiences that are not your own. Even in my own writing, you know, I write about, you know, I, I write about gender a lot and specifically from the perspective of, you know, political candidates and how misogyny and sexism factor into these, uh, into their, their platforms and their candidacies. Um, and I feel comfortable doing that um, only because, especially when I'm writing, doing those sorts of stories, I spend a lot of time reading and listening to what people have already said um, and making sure that I'm not, um, you know, say, describing something in a way that um, sort of taps into whatever uh, sort of subconscious biases I have. Um, but I think it's just a, it's a, it's a muscle you have to work. Um, you know, I think people often think because I am a human in the world, I therefore am able to write about any sort of experience, um, which is just not true. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can, but in a, you know, in a way that people will like. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I just think it's about, uh, putting in a lot of effort in the work uh, to be sensible and thoughtful and rigorous uh, with how you approach these issues, especially if they're not things that you have to think about um, in your in your day to day. And just not assume that your own experience is is universal, you know, mm -hmm. that that you that, I mean, it's really incredible the number of people who think that because they haven't experienced something themselves, it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I think we are getting close to our wrap up time. So um, uh, I'm going to thank everyone for coming and invite everybody who, uh, I don't know, you didn't phone in, but who signed in and, and, um, and joined us to attend um, more social distancing, special social distancing socials on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the future.